All right, inshallah, we'll get started then on the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And just as a recap, uh, last time it got, we had a little bit of mic issues, but alhamdulillah, we got through it. And we got until the adoption of Zayd ibn Haritha, whom the Sahabi, they all knew as Zayd ibn Muhammad because of his closeness to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we learned that Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he says that my generation, we always thought that Zayd ibn Haritha was a full blood uh, son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of the connection they used to have. And this is after the marriage of Khadija radiallahu anha. And we, we know that she gifted Zayd ibn Haritha to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an adopted child. And now we get to the Nabuwat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and him actually becoming a Prophet. So at this time, does anyone know how old the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is? That's right, 40 years old. And how old would Khadija be at this time? 55. Not 52. 55. 55. Yeah, 55. Yeah, so Kazi got it. Because she was around 15 years old, uh, 15 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the majority of sources, which shows that she is a bit more mature than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we will see this maturity later on as well and kind of talk about an, an intricate part of their marriage life as well, inshallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he turned this age, he would begin to meditate and go to a cave, Ghari Hira, and meditate and just think about everything that was happening around him. And he would seclude himself and contemplate. And during this time, not only did Khadija radiallahu anha allow him to do so, but she would help him and assist him by bringing him food and water to the cave as well. So just think about nowadays, if someone did this, usually a wife would get angry, like, why are you doing this? Like, we have stuff to do. But look at the maturity of Khadija radiallahu anha. That not only did she allow him, but she also supported him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in this time as well, many miracles began to happen around the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Does anyone know any of the miracles that would happen? This is the time before the prophethood. Like the total time, or like any miracle that happened okay. during this time. Didn't mm -hmm. he, um, he got. His heart um, mm -hmm. transplanted or something, right? Yeah, so, so he did have his heart removed. This was during his childhood, mm -hmm. and it is a miracle. And that was Jibreel alayhi salam, or an angel that took away the spot that commits sins. So he was not able to do sins. Something that happened closer to the time of him receiving the first revelation is that he noticed that the rocks themselves of Mecca would begin to say salam to him. So he'd just be walking, and even a stone would give him salams. And many years later, when he's talking to his Sahabi, he would tell them that I remember that there was this one rock that whenever I would walk past it, it would say salam to me. Subhanallah. Another thing that happened is that for six months, the dreams of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to come true. And we know that the dreams of the Prophets, they're special because they always come true, that they're usually a sign. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for six months before the first revelation, he would see a dream and this dream would end up coming true. And the only person he had in this time that he could go confide in was Khadija radiallahu anha. And she was always a backbone, a sort of strength for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. And so we know that Jibreel alayhi salam the first revelation came down, it was during the month of Ramadan. Does anyone know what day of the week was it that the first revelation came down? Go ahead. Yes, it was a Monday. And the Prophet Wasallam says that I was born on a Monday and the first revelation also came down on a Monday as well. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he comes and he says, read, iqra, read. And then he squeezes him, the Prophet Wasallam. And at this time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's terrified. He doesn't know what's going on. And then he says, Ma ana biqarit, that I don't know how to read. And then he squeezes him again and he says, Iqra. And he's, he squeezes him so hard that it's as if all the energy leaves his body. And then again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ma ana biqarit, that I don't know how to read. And then Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he squeezes him for a third time. And then he says, Iqra. And then the Prophet says, Ma ana And then Jibreel alayhi salam, he follows it with the verses, 
اقرا بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الانسان من علق اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الانسان ما لم يعلم read o prophet the name of your lord who created created humans from a clinging clot read and your lord is most generous who taught him by the pen taught humanity what they know not and does anyone know what surah this is the first revelation that's right surah alak and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam received this revelation and it scared him it terrified him this whole experience and just imagine if we were in this moment as well how we would be feeling as well and so he's honestly terrified he doesn't know what just happened and the scholars say as well that this is a interesting point that in these short verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the word iqra and even Jibreel alayhi salam he repeated the word iqra so many times which means read and the ulama to say that this is to show the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that no matter what happens no matter what hardships may come no matter what challenges or calamities you go through to keep on reading and to keep on telling people the message of Islam and to never stop no matter what hardships you go to and this is one of the reasons why iqra is being repeated time and time again and now after this whole experience i'll just read the hadith it says that faraja'a biha rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tarjufu bawadiruhu that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he returned with this experience and his shoulders and neck they were trembling hatta dakhala ala khadija faqala until he entered upon khadija radiyallahu anha and he says zammiluni zammiluni that cover me cover me fazammaluhu hatta dhabaha anru anhu arru and so she covered him until the fear it subsided qala li khadija and then he says to khadija ay khadija tu mali laqad khashitu ala nafsi he says, Oh Khadija, what is wrong with me? I feel like something bad is going to happen. And some state that he says this because he feels like maybe something mentally is going on. Because he's seeing things and hearing things. But remember that one of the one of the virtues and benefits of Jibreel alayhi salam squeezing the Prophet was to show him that this isn't a dream. That it's not a hallucination, that this is something real. And this is why the ulama state that Jibreel alayhi salam, one of the reasons why he was squeezed during this time as well. And then after this, he says, فَأَخْبَرْهَا الْخَبَرْ And so he tells Khadija the news. قَالَدْ خَدِيجَةُ كَلَّا أَبْشِرْ So note the response of Khadija. She says, كَلَّا أَبْشِرْ That nay, receive glad tidings instead. فَوَاللَّهِ لَا يُخْزِيكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا for wallahi by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never disgrace you. For wallahi innaka latasillu al-rahim, wa tasdiqu al-hadith, wa tahmilu al-kalla, wa taksibu al-ma'dum, wa taqar al-dayf, wa tu'ayinu ala nawaib al-haq. And then she goes on and on and on praising the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Stating that you take care of the orphans, you help the destitute, you help the widows, and you help those stricken by calamities, and you are generous to people and you are kind to people. And so she goes on and on and on praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during this time. And so we'll come back to this specific part. But after this, not only does she comfort the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but she offers a solution as well. And she takes him to Waraqa Ibn Nufil. Waraqa Ibn Nufil. And we mentioned him before. Does anyone remember the religion that Waraqa Ibn Nufil followed? He was not a Christian, no. So Waraqa Ibn Nufil, do you have a guess? Uh, was it the um, religion that, uh, what, was, I forget the name, but like, they didn't believe in like, the other gods. They what? They didn't believe in polytheism. Yeah, so Zain got it. So it was the Abrahamic religion, and we call them the Hanifs. That there were those who followed a monotheistic religion, but it wasn't Christianity or Judaism. Because they realized there had been changes made to these religions. And so they followed their own monotheistic religion and they're known as the Hanifs. Okay, and so she takes him to Waraqa ibn Nufil. And Waraqa, because he's read the Torah and the Injil, 
He knows that there was a prophet that is to come. And so he affirms him that you are the prophet that we have been waiting for. That you are the prophet that has been spoken about in the Torah and the Injil. And then he says something very interesting to the Prophet wasallam. He says, how I wish I could be there with you on that day to assist you on the day when, you're, when the people of your own city will turn you out of it. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he's, he's thinking about it. He says, what do you mean by this, that my own people will turn me out of my own city? And then Waraka says that when has someone come with your message and the people, they haven't turned him out of the city. That this is usually what happens that when a prophet comes, it is the people themselves whom they're giving the message to that turn them out of that city. However, Waraka ibn Nufal, he passed away shortly after. And so what are the takeaways? And I want to mention one of the takeaways, perhaps the biggest one, is that for the Prophet wasallam, Khadija radiallahu anha was a source of comfort. And we need to keep this in the back of our mind anytime we go over the seerah, because it's hard to go into depth the amount, that bond that the Prophet wasallam had with Khadija during this short time. It's hard to go over that whole bond they share. But just for us to keep in the back of our minds that it's something that meant a lot to the Prophet ﷺ. That whenever a calamity struck him or whenever he was in a hardship, she was a rock for him. Someone that he could always go to and find support and she would never ridicule him as we often see. And subhanAllah, what a woman she was. Because not only did she comfort him, but she also offered a solution which was to go to Waraqa ibn Nufal. And think also the time it takes to walk from Ghari Hira, the top of the from the cave itself on top of the mountain, to the house of Khadija. If anyone's been, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours. And during this time, the hadith states that that his neck and shoulders they were trembling during this whole time. And only when he reached Khadija radiallahu anha and she covered him, did his fear subside. And so it is only the comfort of Khadija radiallahu anha that was able to comfort the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam during this time. And so why do I bring this up? Because it, it is important for us, especially at our age, to know that as brothers we should, look, we should be looking for someone who would be able to be a source of comfort for us. Someone that would be able to give us comfort. And for the sisters to be people whom the husbands can go to and find comfort in. That this is one of the virtues and the biggest virtue of a marriage. That the spouses are there for each other in order to be a form of comfort. And this is actually something the Quran teaches us itself. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Women ayatihi an lakum min anfusikum azwaja. That we have created you from yourselves. And one of his signs is that we have created you spouses. We have created for you spouses. Why? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَسْكُنُوا لِتَسْكُنُوا So that you're able to find in them comfort and find in them ease. This is the word sukun. It comes from لِتَسْكُنُوا And we have this word in Urdu as well. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly telling us that we have been created in spouses so that we're able to find comfort in one another. And this is something that Imam, uh, Imam Ibn Hajar radiallahu or rahimahullah as well as Imam Nawi rahimahullah this day as well where Ibn Hajar he says that this incident of Khadija it shows us what a big comfort she was for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Imam Nawi also states that one of the ni'mah, one of the virtues of Khadija was that she was always a comfort for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And now moving on after his meeting with Waraqa, the Prophet ﷺ didn't receive revelation for a few months, for a certain amount of time. And he would go back to this cave time and time again and wander around Mecca waiting for another sign to come. And then one day the Prophet ﷺ heard his name being called and he began to look around but he didn't see anyone. And then he looks up at the sky and he sees Jibreel ﷺ on the 
on top of a throne between the heavens and the earth. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فجئت منه فرقا فرجعت فقلت زملوني زملوني. And so when he saw Jibril عليه السلام, he was terror stricken. He became terrified again, and then he came back to Khadija, and then he again says زملوني زملوني. That cover me, cover me. And after this is when the second revelation is revealed in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal muddathir Qum fa'anthir Wa rabbaka fa'kabbir Wa thiyabaka fa'tahir Wa rujza fa'hjur Wa la tamnun tastakthir Wa li rabbika fa'sbir That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying O oh, you covered one because he says Zammiluni and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal muddathir Qum fa'anthir Arise and warn And then he says Wa rabbaka fakabbir And revert your Lord alone Purify your garments Continue to shun idols Do not do a favor expecting more in return And so now he's telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What it means to be a Prophet And then he says and persevere for the sake of your Lord. فصبر. And so the second verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فأنذر, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Arise and warn. And this is the start of the public da'wah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't make it public, it's actually the secret da'wah. And this shows that Prophet وسلم, should go and start telling those who are close to him the message of Islam. It is the second verse that revealed this to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we know that Khadija radiallahu anha she was the first to accept Islam, and who after this verse was the first amongst the adults to accept Islam amongst the free adults. That's right. It was Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an who was the first child to accept Islam. That's right. It is Ali radiallahu an. Who was the first freed slave to accept Islam? Allah. It is not Bilal. Zayd? That's right. It is Zayd ibn Haritha because he was living in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is stated by Imam Abu Hanifa. This is how he ranks the people who accepted Islam first. And so I want to go over really quickly the virtues of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an. In that he was the first free man and adult to accept Islam. And the Prophet says in a hadith, وَلَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا خَلِيلًا غَيْرَ رَبِّي لَأَتَّخَذْتُ أَبَا بَكْرٍ That if I were to take a khalil other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I would have taken Abu Bakr to be my khalil. And a khalil is like a close confidant. But then he says that I'm not able to because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken me to be his Khalil. And what a blessing this is for Bukhara Siddiq. Another is that he is mentioned indirectly in the Quran, and here is perhaps his biggest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran while they are making the hijrah that Illa Tansuru Fakad Nasurahullah is Akrajahulladina Kafaru Thaniathane. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in three instances. The first he says, ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ That it does not matter if you believers do not support him. For Allah did in fact support him when the disbelievers drove him out of Mecca. And he was only one of two. And the second is Abu Bakr because they both made the hijrah together. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ That when they were in the cave, the Prophet wasallam says to his sahib, to his friend. And this affirms the status of Abu Bakr an as a sahabi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is affirming the status for him. لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا that do not worry, do not grieve. In Allah ma'ana. Indeed, Allah is with us. And so this shows again the blessing of Abu Bakr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is saying that I am with the Prophet and Abu Bakr. In Allah ma'ana. That he is with us. 
And so this shows the virtues of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and this solidifies his position. No matter what any group, no matter what any people say about him, this itself is alone to solidify his position as the best amongst the Sahaba. And the ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they also state that there is ijma' on this matter, that the best amongst the Sahaba was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. And another one of his virtues is that the next converts that came was from his own da'wah. So he would go himself and preach to these people. And some of their names are Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, Uthman ibn Affan, Zubair ibn Al-Awwam, and Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Anhum. All of them, they all accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Now does anyone know what is something interesting about all these Sahaba that I have mentioned? Does anything come to mind? Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, Uthman, Zubair, and Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Does yeah, that's right. So I heard in the back that they are Ashara Mubashara, the 10 promised paradise. And this makes sense that the earliest were the ones who were promised paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of how they assisted in this religion of Islam. And now what group other than the Ashara Mubashara think politically, what group do all of these people I named belong to? Does anyone know? Go ahead. I heard some. There, some of them are from the Umayyads, but you are narrowing it. So they're basically from the Quraysh. And not only are they from the Quraysh, but from their, they're from the noble tribe. So like you said, uh, the Banu Umayyah, the Banu, there's from the Quraysh, from the Banu Hashim as well. So they're from the noble tribes of Quraysh. And what does this show? It shows that Islam was not only accepted by those who were downtrodden, but it was also accepted by those of the nobility. And something that's very important to take away from this is that the nobles, the nobility, they often have a lot more to lose in accepting their religion. So it's a lot tougher for them to accept. However, we see that because the message of Islam was right, and because it was a true message, that even the nobles, they dropped all the wealth they had in order to accept the message of Islam. And so uh, the next class after this were the servants and inshallah we'll come to their story. I'll just mention their names right now. It is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the servants of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, and Bilal ibn Rabah, Khabab ibn Al-Arat, Yasir ibn Amir, Al Yasir ibn Amir alongside his wife Sumayya and his son Ammar ibn Yasir. And so this uh, da'wah went on for three years and this was private da'wah. So he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not make the da'wah public yet. And does anyone know what is the reason the Prophet ﷺ kept it secret and did not make the da'wah public? Anyone know? It's actually a pretty simple answer. This answer is that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give him permission to make it public yet. Because no, the prophets are not able to make these types of movements in terms of religion without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly commanding them to do so. And so three years the da'wah was uh, private and in terms of the religion itself, in terms of like the deen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was teaching them the basics. So he's, he was teaching them to fulfill the ties of kinship, to be good to one's family. And the third, and this one was the one they pretty much all had to dispute on, was to break all idols so that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped. And this was basically what caused the rift between him and a lot of the Quraysh. And at this time, know that wudu and prayer itself, they were voluntary acts. As well as a lot of the acts we have, such as pilgrimage and fasting, these were all voluntary, that it had not been prescribed as fard or wajib within the religion itself. And before we go on, we talk about the stages of the da'wah, and there were five. Number one was private da'wah, which went on from the first and third year after the revelation. The second stage was public da'wah with no military combat. And this went on for a long, a longer time frame. It was from the third to the tenth year since the revelation of the Quran. The third stage was public da'wah with selective military combat. And this was selective with only the Quraysh. 
with only the Quraysh. And this went on from the first year after the Hijrah until the sixth year after the Hijrah. And the fourth was open da'wah with self-defense. And this went on for the full, basically, the first year after the Hijrah until the tenth year of the Hijrah as well. And then the fifth was open da'wah with full military combat in self-defense. And this went on during the time of the Khulafa where they would fight the Romans and the Persians in order to make sure that they were able to defend themselves and their land wasn't overtaken. And the ulama, they state that now the religion itself is, there's no need for number five anymore because there's no more Romans or Persians attacking us. So they state that it has gone back to the fourth category, which is open da'wah and fighting in self-defense. Okay, so the ulama, they state that this is the stage that we're on right now. And then after three years, the Prophet ﷺ received the following verse in the Qur'an where he says, uh, So proclaim what you have been commanded and turn away from polytheists. And so this verse is what ended the secret da'wah and started the public da'wah. So years 3 to 10 before the hijrah itself or three years after the revelation and until the 10th year, so the year of the Hijrah. And so he started with his immediate family, the Banu Hashim. And Ali radiallahu an, he was told to prepare food for about 40 people. And can anyone check the time of iftar as well? Sa'ad, you got it. And so after finishing the food, so food was prepared for 40 people and he invited the whole entire family. So his whole family and those who were close to him. And after finishing the food, one of them was Abu Lahab. And what was the relation of Abu Lahab to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's right, he was his uncle. And so after finishing the food, Abu Lahab, he had an inkling that he would start to preach. Because he might have heard that the secret da'wah was going on. And so Abu Lahab, after finishing his meal, he immediately gets up and leaves the room. Right? Because he's like, I'm not going to sit around waiting for any preaching. And so he leaves the room and the other people, they're saying he's like a chieftain, he's a higher up. So they end up following him as well and they leave the room as well. So the Prophet ﷺ was not able to preach to them. What time is it? 7.10. 7 All right, inshallah. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he repeats this. So he invites these 40 people again to his house for a full dinner. And Ali radiallahu anhu, who's still a child, was told to make all the food and wonder how he must have been feeling that he's got to cook again for all these people. And then before they're able to finish the food, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now he begins to preach. And he starts with the khutbatul haja, what we start the khutbah of Friday as well, where he says, all praise is due to Allah, I praise him and seek his help. I believe in him and rely upon him alone. I testify that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. Inna alhamdulillah nahmuduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiruh and that whole khutbah is given to them. And then Abu Lahab at this, Abu Lahab becomes very angry. And he gets up and he says, O Banu Abdul Muttalib, by Allah this call is reprehensible. So obstruct him before others do so. If you don't, you'll either be accepting Islam or you'll be disgracing yourselves. And so Abu Lahab, he's basically angry at this and he's warning the other people that stop listening to this message and you people should leave as well. And then a short while later, the Prophet ﷺ climbs Mount Safa and he begins to call the tribes. And he tells them that if I told you, so he's, uh, he's on a higher mount and he calls all the tribes and he's calling them by name. And then he, he preaches to all of them and he says that if I told you that horsemen were advancing to attack you from the valley on the other side of this mountain, would you believe me? And all of them, they say, yes, of course, we have never known you to be a liar. And then the Prophet ﷺ then says, then know that I am a warner of an impending severe punishment. And then he says, he takes them by name, O Banu Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay, save yourselves from the fire of hell for I will not be able to help you on the day of judgment. O Banu Murra ibn Ka'ab, save yourselves from the fire of hell. And then he goes on and on naming the tribes, starting from the, from the one furthest from him and coming narrower. And then he, he reaches, O Banu Abd Manaf, 
And then when he reaches this tribe, which is his own tribe, he begins to take names. And he says, O oh, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, accept Islam for I will not be able to help you on the day of judgment. For I will not be able to save you from the fire. O oh, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, his aunt. And then he reaches, O oh, Fatima bint Muhammad, accept Islam, save yourselves from the fire. For I will not be able to help you on the day of judgment. And then after this, Abu Lahab, he stood up and he picked up some sand and he threw it in the direction of the Prophet wasallam. And this was in a display of disgust. And he says that, may your hands perish. This was an expression of the Arabs. He says, Tabalak, that may your hands perish. Is this the reason that you have gathered us here today? And right after this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verses in the Quran. Tabbat yada abi wa tab. مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبُ سَيَصْلَى نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبُ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the whole surah, surah of uh, Lahab, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, May the hands of Abu Lahab perish, and he himself perish. Neither his wealth nor worldly gains will benefit him, and he will burn in a flaming fire. And so the whole surah is revealed. And look how Abu Lahab says, Tabalak, may your hands be cursed, O Muhammad. And right after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, Tabat yada abi lahab watab. That may the hands of Abu Lahab be cursed. And this surah itself was so poetic. And this was honestly a punishment for Abu Lahab. It was so poetic and so beautiful that the children of Mecca themselves, they would start reciting this as well. For like the next few days and for weeks, they, they would just start reciting this surah as well because it was so beautiful. And so this was a punishment for Abu Lahab. And look as well, it shows the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when someone even uttered one thing against him, immediately revelation comes down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursing the one who first cursed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so after this, we know that they studied and learned in Dar al-Arqam. So this is where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would meet with these converts and teach them about the religion of Islam. Does anyone know who was the owner of this house? The name of the owner. Dar al Arqam. It's in the name. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it is Arqam. It's Al Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And he was the owner of the house. And he was from the Banu Makhzum. And no one would expect that a Makhzumi is harboring a Hashimi. And so this is why they were able to secretly meet in the house of Al Arqam ibn Abil Arqam and teach them the religion of Islam. And this house it was also centered near the center of Mecca. And so, uh, one of the one of the smart uh, positionings of this is that amongst the hustle and bustle, no one would really see someone going in and out of a house. They would, they would just blend in with a crowd. And so, this is why one of the reasons why his house was used in preaching the religion as well. And then uh, the people of Quraysh they went to Abu Talib. Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who had been taking care of him. And they said that your nephew, he's gone way beyond his position in attacking these idols of ours. Because they love their idols. It was their tradition in worshipping these idols. So he's saying that he's gone far beyond his, his, uh, his position in attacking these idols. So tell him to stop doing so. And then Abu Talib, he goes to the Prophet wasallam, And he's a chieftain. And he's saying that you're making things a bit difficult for me. So won't you stop this preaching that you're doing? Because it's becoming very hard on me as well. And then the Prophet wasallam says to Abu Talib, he says, Oh my uncle, by Allah, if you were to give me the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, I would still not stop preaching this religion of Islam until I have succeeded or I am martyred. And then after this, Abu Talib tells him that do as you wish, O nephew, for by Allah, wallahi, 
I will never approach you again asking you to stop. And after this, we see that Abu Talib, until his death, he supported and helped the Prophet wasallam. even though until the end he did not accept the religion of Islam. And then something else that happened in publicizing this religion where the Prophet wasallam and the companions, they said that one of us, we should go in front of the Kaaba and start reciting Qur'an. Start reading the Qur'an to the people so they understand what this religion is. But a lot of the Sahaba didn't want to do so because it was basically a death sentence because they, were, they would definitely get attacked. And then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, he's saying that I will do this and I will do it no matter what happens to me. And a lot of them, they were apprehensive. They didn't want Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to be the one doing this because unlike the others, he was a servant and he didn't have a clan in Mecca that would be able to protect him. Because the others, they had a form of protection that if they were attacked, because of the tribal mindset that they used to have at that time, no matter what they were preaching, the tribe would come and help them against wh whoever was attacking them. However, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, he didn't have this. However, he still went out. And because he constantly said that, let me be the one to do this. And so he went out and started reciting the Qur'an. And mashallah, it was such a beautiful recitation. And yet the Quraysh, they still surrounded him and they began to beat him so much that he became unconscious. And so the others that told him that didn't we tell you not to do this? And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh saying that I did it and I do not regret doing it. And if I were given the opportunity, I would do it again and again and again. And now, right before we finish, we're going for about five more minutes. We'll talk about the torture that the Muslims would go through at this time. Know that a lot of the torture was happening to the servants and slaves of Mecca. Because as I said, the higher ups and the nobility, they would have their tribes that would come and protect them and offer them protection. And they wouldn't let them get hurt. So it was all, it was usually the servants and the slaves who would bear the brunt of the Quraysh as well. And one of them whose story that we know the most is perhaps Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anh, who went who basically had one of the harshest forms of torture by his owner. And does anyone know the name of his owner? It is Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And his torture was so bad that he would take Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, out on a desert and he would put him on a hot rock. He would tie him up and place him on a hot rock. You know, the rocks in the desert, they're, they're steaming. And Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, he states later on in his life that those rocks would be so hard that you would be able to cook meat on them. And he would be placed on that rock and he would be whipped as well. And he would be told that say that there are other gods as well. That say that I believe in Allah and Al-Uzza, the other gods of the Quraysh. And all he would say is Ahadun Ahad, one, one. That there is only one God. Until the end, Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, he never gave up. He never even uttered a form of uh, that, that he would be leaving the religion of Islam. Not once did these words come from his, his mouth. And day after day, torture after torture, all he would say is Ahadun Ahad. That Allah is one, Allah is one. And then it is, you know, someone else is Khabab ibn al-Arat. Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu who was also one of the first 10 people to accept Islam and he was an Arab of Yemeni origin and his owner was Umm Anmar Umm Anmar and what she would do is similar to Bilal she would honestly hire a group of people to come and attack Khabab ibn al-Arat to attack him so she would hire a mob to basically attack him something else she would do is she would take him out in a desert and she would take a hot piece of iron and place it on his back and he would be tied up so much so that later on during the time of Umar radiallahu an, Umar was shown these scars on his back and he said subhanallah the amount of torture that you would have gone through Khabab and radiallahu an, and later on it is stated that his owner she would end up being cauterized and she would die a very horrible death because of the torture that she would make Khabab go through. 
And someone else that I want to narrate, and actually Khabab, really quickly before I move on from him, is that Khabab ibn al-Arat, radiallahu an, mashaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him so much later on in his life in terms of wealth. Because as Sahaba, they would receive a stipend from the Khalifa at the time, based on how much they served the religion. And Khabab, he became a very wealthy person, subhanAllah. And it is narrated that at the time of his death, it's saying that he began to cry so much. And the people that surrounded him and they said that why are you crying? You suffered so much in the path of Islam and surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you even more. And Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an, he says, I'm not crying out of pain or out of fear in meeting Allah. I'm crying because of what you see around you, meaning his house because he lived in a big house as well. And he says, how will I answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this luxury? Indeed, I was with a group of people who were all tortured on equal footing, but every one of them has departed without tasting the sweetness of this world. And Allah has left me to enjoy the fruits of this world. And I'm scared that because I've enjoyed the fruits of this world, my share of the hereafter will be less than that of my companions. And then he says that as he prepared his coffin, he began, he began to cry once more. And he says, by Allah, wallahi, I remember Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he did not even have a cloth, he did not even have a cloth for his own kafin. Yet here I am, yet, yet here I am with this luxurious kafin in front of me. And what will I do when I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how will I answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this luxury? And there are a few more stories, inshallah, we'll stop here for today and in uh, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking for forgiveness before we open the iftar. Jazakallah khair for coming. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim.